welcome or welcome back. My name is Carly. This is my grocery adventure. And we are joined today for the first time, hopefully of many, uh, by Kathy Drager. Kathy, so glad to have you on today's episode. Welcome to my grocery adventure. Thank you, Carly. I'm excited to be here. Oh, gosh. Kathy was telling me that she is a fan of the podcast and has really enjoyed some of the other guest stories. And I'm right there with you as far as like the, what people are willing to do to come on and just share, like, here's what I went through, you know, and all you're doing seemingly small thing is just tell your story. And then what I hear from people who watch the episodes is that it's really not a small thing to get to listen to like kind of the behind the scenes play by play. So for everyone who's appeared on an episode and Kathy today, thank you for taking the time to sit down and and share what you're going to share, whatever that is, whatever that is. But, you know, the humans and storytelling probably has a 300,000 year history. Mm. And so it is, it's just so interesting to hear the stories and the places that you've chosen to highlight those stories I don't think we get to hear those every day the people their backgrounds their whys um like Mm w-h-y whys um it's just been it's those, those delightful stories I actually feel like what you're compiling is a love song to a lot of these rural places and I am enjoying listening to that love song oh That's what it feels a little bit like a love letter to the human condition of like not having any idea what's going on and having to make the best of it, (laughs) you know, like not having some big plan or I don't, I don't know where all this is headed. I just know that I feel like this is the best option I have right here, right now. And that's what we keep hearing in the episodes is like, that's really all we ever know is what feels the most right, right here, right now. So right here, right now, there's nowhere in the world I would rather be than sitting here about to get to hear the beginning of Kathy's story. Like, where does the Kathy Drager come from? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? What was that like? Let's start there. Jump right into it. Um, So I was, um, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was, um, given up for adoption at birth um, from a very young woman from rural Northwestern Minnesota um, who made a hard choice to give me a, she was a teenager, made a hard choice to give me a better life. And I was adopted by very loving, imperfect people. And so have had, um, had a, a a good rich life experience as a child and growing up uh, we were in Minneapolis just for a couple years and then my parents moved quite a bit with my dad's job so um, moved every two to four years um, and mostly in rural places I, I spent most of my growing up years in in small towns and farming commu- first in farming communities in southern Minnesota. And then I graduated from high school in Silver Bay, Minnesota, which is on the north shore of Lake Superior and um, is a mining and um, taconite um, manufacturing town. And so I lived in that town um, until I graduated from high school. Um, and that was in in itself was just an incredible learning experience because while I was there, the the plant, the taconite plant, uh, was going through a lot of changes, and the union uh, eventually would be more or less busted, and people were losing their houses, and the population of the town decreased by about I think about half at that point when from in the three thousand you know, in the mid 3000 range to the, you know, probably 18, 1900 range. So dropped about half the population. And and some of the people that left and lost their homes were my parents as well. 
So it was just an interesting piece of American life that I don't think many people of my generation have seen, like that kind of economic. I mean, I know, you know, other places, Detroit, there were other manufacturing communities that similarly struggled. Um, but it was just a very interesting to be walking to school and there'd be another house boarded up along my way to school which I think many Americans, at least, um, like I said, of my generation haven't experienced necessarily firsthand. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, but Silver Bay, Minnesota, fabulous place to grow up. Couldn't be more beautiful. I can still remember the smell of the fine soil and the pines in the springtime and right on Lake Superior. And we made good use of outdoor time, ice fishing and, you know, playing in Lake Superior and doing good stuff. So it was a very good place to grow up. Yeah. Gosh, like what was that like to move every couple of years as a child? You know, um, it really was, really didn't, I don't think it impacted me that much. I'm a pretty adaptable person, probably a mix of extrovert and introvert, I do well being reflecting. I do well, I enjoy talking to people. Both of them refuel my jets. So um, I did really didn't struggle with, with the moves that much. Maybe they came at good times, you know, in terms of like development. Um, but yeah, no, I it wasn't one too much of an issue. Yeah. No. Well, that's a blessing because yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if I would have been built for something like that. But Did you grow up in the same same school? Like the same school, K through 12, the same house, 2 through 18. Like I was planted like a tree right there. So yeah, it always fascinates me to hear about upbringings where you do move around a lot and you meet a whole new set of kids, you know, every few years. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't ever experience that. Yeah. No, I, I did. And I do have friends from all those eras of my life. So I'm lucky oh. that like from the time I was up till fifth grade, I still stay in contact with a friend I had in that era, you know, in my middle school, I got invited to the class reunion for that middle school in my high school. I'm, I, I Snapchat my friend from high school every day, 365 days a year. So I was, at least I'm able to maintain some attachment, but I will say it's funny. Um, last night I, I talked to my daughter. She drives to her job at six o'clock in the morning. So she gives me a call when she's driving on Wednesdays. And I was like, I had a dream last night and, she, and she's a mental health professional. So her journey in this rural place related to a rural grocery store led her to be a rural mental health um, she's just finishing her graduate studies uh, for to be a licensed counselor in rural mental health. And so I was like, I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night that I had a home and it was on the edge of this farm and there was a field and there were these deep erosion gullies. They were so deep. I was afraid if I fell into them, you know, I'd be harmed. And then I was telling her about the little house. And I was like, all my dreams involve houses. And of course, she's like, so tell me about that. What is that? what is all those dreams about houses about? And it's like always looking for that home. I'm always looking for the, that home that like you just yeah. said, like I'm rooted, like rooted, like a tree. Yeah. Like I haven't really had that. Yeah. That, like, and that, that searching for that home, that just that kind of archetypical home, yeah. this one, it was like sunny, but it was so old and it was like an been abandoned farmhouse for like 25 years, but the windows were intact. And, but I was like, oh, this is going to be cold in the winter. So I anyway, remember so thinking that like in your dream, in my dream, I remember thinking this is going to be cold in the winter, which makes me wonder if I was like cold in my sleep, you know, to figure into like influence my dream. But I have a lot of dreams about homes and, and being inside homes and oh. what they look like or driving past homes and trying to look into homes. So that might be, if I was going to psychoanalyze myself, I would say Let's start right there. anything about moving that, that, that might be it is my, yeah. my dream life is full of homes. Well, so. yeah. I mean, it, it takes time for roots to grow. Yep. And if you keep repotting the plant every little bit, 
the roots are in shock every time you do that. Like I'm, I'm talking plants, but like humans right. are not much more complicated. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. And um, so I'm going to write down a word so I don't forget to say this, but so the life that I gave my children okay. is that we moved to Big Stone County, Minnesota, which is on the Western edge of Minnesota. So Minnesota is pretty straight. It follows, um, the Red River, you know, from the North to the, till you get to the bump, there's a yeah. bump on the Western edge. So I live right on that bump, which is right on the South Dakota border. But we moved out here when our kids were, our twin boys were three and our daughter at that time was seven. And we moved to Big Stone County and my boys, they've been in the same school from three-year-old head start through 12-year-old, 12th 12, grade graduation. So they had completely the same, the same school, the house. They've never, except when we moved to the farm. Uh, they've never had any, any other house. Yeah. So, and now that they're both in college, they both started college. Um, I'm remodeling. So I like, I painted their bedrooms, gotten bed spreads, and they're even like, what are you doing? Why are you changing? I'm like, it's our history. I'm like, you know what? The house needed a little paint, but yeah. they're not even happy about that. So that's, oh. that's kind of funny. so yeah. So I'm giving my children in that sense, something that um, wasn't what I experienced, but I also, I, like I said, I, in, I actually enjoyed those places that I lived. Like when we lived in Dodge center, Minnesota, we lived in the country. I had a horse, I had friends, we'd go horseback riding. You know, when I moved to silver Bay, I got to live a really outdoorsy life, you know, like really a nature, nature, free range based, you know, young, you know, teenage years, which was yeah. fabulous. Yeah. I could see beauty and adventure and depth in all of it. Yeah. Well, cause there is, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's the grass is always greener kind of yeah. mentality. Like no matter how you grew up, there's probably some things about it that you wouldn't go back and redo just the right. same way if you could choose, you know, but yeah. that's probably everybody. To yeah. some extent. And I was talking to somebody this morning about, you know, we grow how we grow based mm -hmm. on what the conditions are, what the yeah. resources are that are available to us. And we grow how we grow. And that is one reason I'm so passionate about doing these deep dive episodes into people's stories is like, you know, you're not just the tree that you are, you grew into that. Yeah. You know, there were droughts for five years. And that's why you got tall and spindly instead of like big and round and bushy. Like there, there were reasons why it was what it was. And mm. those pieces, they tie together. If you, yeah, if you really take your time and look at it. So I love, I love hearing like, you know, what did happen and what came from it? Mm -hmm. You know, you dream about houses and you were very intentional about giving your kids that piece. It felt important to you. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so in school, like, did you like school? Was that a natural fit? I mean, I asked because you work for a university currently. Yep. Have I, you always I, been? Yeah, I like school. I, I did. I enjoyed school. I like reading. I've always been a voracious reader. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky when I went to school in Silver Bay, it was still a, a mining town so the school was really a very for the size of the town it was fabulous high school mm -hmm. and my p i had my like i had a french teacher who had a doctorate in french in silver bay and we had a you know art teacher mm -hmm. i mean we had kilns and jewelry making and rock sign and sculpt i took sculpture in high school in silver bay minnesota yeah you know, and, and so I spent like my senior year just taking a whole bunch of I, art classes. And, you know, I went into the sciences, and I think I'm drawn to the sciences, but I am so grateful for the, you know, the arts education, yeah. and the language and the literature that I learned in Silver Bay, Minnesota. And yeah. so I did fine in, in school. And then when I got to college, um, I would say that if I struggled in college, 
it was because I got lost in the system. So I was a first generation college student. And so I did not know what I was doing. And um, I was on the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. And they just let me register for anything, anytime, no advisor. I would get the course catalog and I'll date myself back in those days. It was like an actual paper catalog. And I would start leafing through the catalog and I'd be like, Ooh, Swahili. I need to take that. And I did. And I'd be like, Oh, abnormal psychology. That sounds fascinating. Russian history. Why am I, I take Russian history. Course, yeah. You know, I mean, if you just had like at your fingertips, just anything, you yeah. know, and so, and then I, I hit onto the rhetoric department, which was, you know, the study of, you know, classical, like Aristotle, Socrates, and then war and peace. And, you know, like we, all this stuff. And I took every class that the rhetoric department offered every single class. And now I'm at six and a half years in college. Right. And I finally, they're like, you should see an advisor. We think you should see an advisor and see if you can get a degree. Well, luckily the university had something they called an individually designed degree program. Oh, and nice. I met, met with this advisor and he's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, you only need like 160 credits to get, graduate and you've got 218 credits. Um, and yet nothing that lines up with the degree, right? Like, how does that happen? Nobody um, helped you. I cannot believe they let you go six and a half years with no advisor. It may have been just six years, but it was a still. Long time. Oh my gosh. That's a like normal time. now. Like you have, there's an advisor. I think there was, then there was a big like to do in crisis because no one was graduating from the university of Minnesota in four years. And then it became like a scandal. Like what's happening to all these kids? Like they're going to school for eight years, you know, to get an undergraduate degree. Oh my God. And then the university like kind of got on the ball and started taking care of people like me. I had good GPA. I just had no direction. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like I, I mean, I loved taking classes, but I, my, at that point, my parents didn't have any money, not even like a, here's $20 to fill your gas tank money mm -hmm. to support me. So I was like working three jobs for the first couple of years. And then I got a good lot, a good job in the soils lab, soil science lab. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me, you know, to be able to like eat and have a roof over my head. Um, so it wasn't like I had, like, I was a trust fund baby who had no direction. I was working darn hard to pay my tuition um, every, you know, at that time it was quarters even. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I met with this advisor and he looked at my everything I'd taken. He's like, you know what, we're just going to make an individually designed degree program for you. And it's going to be called life sciences and rhetoric. So that is, that is what I ended up with as an undergraduate degree after seven years, it took seven years. After seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. A life sciences and rhetoric degree. Yes. Mm -hmm. You might be the only person in the whole yep. world with yep. one of those. Yes. <laughs> one because of a kind. What, what I had done was I knew what the prerequisites were for medical school because I was on my way to medical school. So I knew that I needed to take, you know, two years of chemistry, one years of physics, anatomy, physiology, you know, organic chem, biochem. So I had taken everything. I could cross everything off what I needed to get into med school. I just had no degree. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that's how I ended up with the biology. And then I also just love the rhetoric. Oh, yeah. I, took, I took every class the department offered. So yeah, just for fun, just for fun. It was what? Fascinating. Yeah. Like what stands out that you learned at that time that was like so magnetizing? Like, what was it about it? You know, that was the first time I read Willa Cather even because there was like the, you know, like the literature, you know, like agro, you know, like agronomic literature on agriculture and farming um and uh you know i loved the course on taking on the book war and peace like that was just fabulous and i did enjoy all the classics like the classic arguments from you know socrates and you like know what? plato i didn't study I, anything even close to this okay you, you can know like educate the, me a lot like the idea that oh 
you know, just ideas about how we should be talking and debating. And even more than that, like, is life, is life reality? Are we looking at ourselves? You know, are we, are we an image of ourselves on the screen? Like, who are we fundamentally? Like, those are some of the questions even that we got into in rhetoric. So it was, you know, kind of philosophical, but also, you know, a deep exploration of how we, what is it, what does it mean to be in a civic relationship, you know? So, yeah, I, I just, I, and I enjoyed the professors too, you know, like there was a group of professors that I would have taken anything, anything they taught. So I had one like that where I took two classes just because he was the one teaching it. I was like, yeah. you're awesome, dude. Thank you. Yeah. Um, wow. I yeah. can't believe you were thinking about that stuff like in your late teens, early twenties. Yeah. Like, did you think about it before? Like, or did you find those kinds of questions in college or had you already been asking those questions and it's like, here's where you go to answer those questions? You know, I mean, going back to Silver Bay, I had a really good creative writing teacher. His name was John Sauls. Um, and ironically, from Silver Bay to um, Big Stone County is about 320 miles. Like Silver Bay is on the Northeast. I'm on the kind of the Central West. Mm -hmm. He is also here in Big Stone County. So he retired here to Big Stone County. And then we bought our fam, my husband's family farm here. And when we ran into each other, we were like, what? My favorite teacher. He's like, I'll, I'll say this. He said I was his favorite student. I don't know if that's true, but I'll just say it. You totally. Know? Yeah. <laughs> in a that moment, favorite, you definitely a, were. We'll say a favorite student. Right. Anyway, right. we're so here. We're both here. But he was a phenomenal creative writing teacher. Oh and God. I have a daily writing practice. I'm I'm looking like right over there. I have a, I'd say pretty much 365 days a year writing practice. Yeah. And it's in no small part because of the good education I got in Silver Bay. When you say writing practice, is it like journaling or like creative writing, like stories and stuff? Both. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's awesome. So like your whole life you've been doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. I'll bet you Just got a whole bookshelf. I, I have, yeah, I have a tote. couple bookshelves. <laughs> I have a tote. I have a tote and it's wrapped with a uh, tape and it says, open in the event of my death oh my gosh because Nobody there's like there's it. stories in there that my children shouldn't read till i'm gone right oh <laughs> good for you for letting them out even though you don't want anybody else to read them yeah yeah good for you yeah, you know no, my kids can read them when i'm gone so <laughs> i won't care then yeah good yeah you. that's right yeah oh my gosh wow so okay so first generation college student was there any question in your mind that you were going to go to college? Mm. I don't think I was particularly encouraged to go to college. No, I was not. I heard some of your other, your, your other guests saying, oh, there was no question I was going to college. That was not the case in my family. Did you get pushback on your desire to go to college? I didn't get help. It was more just like neutral, like do yes. what you want to do. I There were no college site visits like, you know, I did with my kids. There were no... Let's go check out a couple colleges. There was no applying for, you know, there was no help in applying for college. Um, so hmm. I would say it was just pretty much, oh, that's interesting. Is that what you think you're going to do? You know, no, no particularly positive or negative um, approach to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And for you, like, was college just something that you always wanted to do? Not, I mean, I, I did not dream about going to college. I did not dream about what I was going to do or be. I think I had a pretty limited view of what I would do. Um, I think there was just very few options. I wasn't going to keep working at the Dairy Queen, which is where I was working, you know? Yeah. Yeah, not this. And, um, so college was like a thing you could do. And so I did it. Mm -hmm. I 
went to the closest college to my small town, which was, I was in Silver Bay and there was one in Duluth at University of Minnesota Duluth. And I went there for two years. Um, and I, I mean, again, I did enjoy it. I, I, I enjoyed it. I yeah. loved it. It was a good environment. Like once I was there, like I did work very hard. I was working three jobs, you know, I was working in the school cafeteria, you know, schlepping lasagna for the kids and living in the dorms. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't live in the dorms. I lived, you know, I rented a room in a house off campus. Um, I worked for um, a restaurant where I waitressed and I read to blind students uh, for the state services for the blind, blind college students. So I was working three jobs to pay my own rent, buy my own food and pay my own tuition, mm. um, even as a freshman in college. Um, but I love the, I love the classes. I loved the coursework. I, I, I really, it resonated with me. Yeah. The, the learning. I, I probably always loved learning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So seven years now huh? you've got your life sciences degree and your ah. rhetoric degree. Mm -hmm. And then what, like, it sounds like they more prompted you like, Hey, let's get a degree out of this. Yeah. So like, where was your head at as far as like what you were going to do next? So I had a pivotal, mo pivotal moment when I was 20, 21. Um, I applied as an undergraduate, obviously, since I was an undergraduate till I was 24, 25. Um, uh, I applied for a job in the soils lab, soil microbiology lab. And I went in to interview for it. I'm sitting in this, you know, Borlaug Hall, named after, you know, Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for mm. the Green Revolution. Anyway, I'm sitting in in third floor Borlaug Hall, second floor. And uh, with this professor, he interviews me. He's like, well, I've got two candidates. You're both about the same. You know, he said, took a coin out of his pocket. He said, call it. Heads or tails. He flipped the coin. I called tails. He's like, it's tails. You've got the job, he said. And that job changed my life. Is that really how he gave you the job? That is really how he gave me the job. That is really how he gave me the job. Yes. <laughs> but here's the thing, Carly. I always win. Not, I'm knocking on wood, but I always win coin toss. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so he didn't know it, but I got a thing with coin tosses. Like yeah. I'm coin tosses like I got this it's in the bag coin Tails. toss I can do that, I can do that. So, <laughs> Seems um, good to me. anyway yeah so I started that job and and now I'm and you know that probably that probably having that good job and it was a good community I had a community I had an, a desk in it and my, I like, they gave me space. I had my own desk for, mm -hmm. a, you know, for an undergraduate and who didn't know what she was doing, like having a, uh, a place in this academic setting that was mine and my fellow, the, the other people who worked in the lab, they were from Jamaica, Uganda, China, Ecuador, Colombia, you know, uh, a guy who was formerly like a railroad roughneck in Nebraska who decided to change his life and, and, you know, get a, get a degree. And, um, you know, we were such an interesting group and we were kind of tight, you know, it felt really good oh. to be part of that, like soil microbiology lab and community. We had lunch together, you know, like we had a place we'd sit and eat our lunch. And so it probably didn't incentivize me to scream through my undergraduate degree because I mm -hmm. felt like I had a good job. I liked the job. I was doing experiments. My boss encouraged me to write an so this was this, this, I have to tell you, his name was Dr. Peter Graham and he was from Australia. Um, and Dr. Graham encouraged me as an undergraduate to write an undergraduate research opportunities grant, um, which was um, 
you know, it was something like you could pose some research and you could do research. They would pay you your salary and they would give you like, like a generous lab supply budget. So I, I wrote up a soils, um, a soil microbiology experiment and research I wanted to do, submitted it and it was awarded. And that, that just doing that changed the entire trajectory of my life and my career because I could have, I could have an idea and I could write it on paper and I could get it funded and I could do what I want to do. Like, I don't have to find a job, have a boss tell me, hope it's what I like, blah, blah, blah. I can like come up with the idea, fundraise for it and do it myself. Um, and so that just that like aha moment was just really foundational. And I've used that my whole entire career. It's why I do the, it's partly why I do the rural grocery work, right? It's how I do the rural grocery work Yeah, um, is because I'm like, this is a sector that needs attention. And you scan the landscape till you find someone whose values align with yours and you articulate the need and what you can do and how you're going to do it. And then they, they like bless you and you get to do it. They you know? write you a check. Yeah. They write you a check and they your say, reports. yeah, that's yeah. right. But it gives you the freedom to identify a need in the world. Think about how you would remedy it articulate it in writing and find the resources to do it. And I have done it consistently since that undergraduate research opportunities grant. And um, then just one more vignette about that. Oh. So I was in this community of graduate students and, you know, the guy from Nebraska who, who he and I would have, you know, we had really like arguments. I was super liberal, progressive out protesting on the, you know, the college mall for whatever the issues were of the time. And he was like a railroad, railroad worker from Nebraska. And we were getting fights about gun control and all sorts of different things. It was just a really, you know, open debating environment. And, but he sometimes ground me a little bit. And when so he needed some lab supplies and he went to our joint boss to Dr. Graham and said, Dr. Graham, I need these lab supplies, blah, blah, blah. And Peter said, well, you know, who has a budget and who might be able to help you with that? Kathy. He made this PhD student go to the undergraduate student to ask for funding to fund some lab equipment he needed that, I mean, it served us both. But he was like, I could really use this and I'm making the case for it. And I'm like, hmm, that sounds like it might be a good use of my money, right? So I also learned about the power, That's you know, so that you can get from being able to, you know, it, like there's other, there were other benefits that came along with being able to write your own ticket to do the work you thought was needed. And so, yeah, so here I am. Mm -hmm. I uh, write grants all the time and they fund the work that I do and the work that my staff do at the regional sustainable development partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. What a skill. What a skill. I know. That yep. like all because the professor was like, hey, you should try this. I know. Yes. Changed my life. I, you know, before I came to the university, I uh, ran, I started two different S, S corporations. The first one was called Sustainability International, and I sold that to an engineering firm. And then I started a second S corporation. It was called Environmental Ground Inc., which it's still open, and I still occasionally do consulting under that umbrella. Um, but that is what I do. That is a large part of what I, and that is how I started my business. It was like, you know, you could really use some research on how this thing is working for you. I did agricultural and environmental research and development. And I say, you could really, we could really study this and this is how we could study it. And we could find out 
if our theory of change is actually, in this case, I'll just give you an example about some water quality work we did in the state. Like we believe that we're doing the right thing to impact water quality. What if we set up an experiment so we could find out if in fact that is having the outcome that we want, write it up, you know, and I brought in the funding for that. Um, and yeah, you know, there you go. I, I, I started a business and my business was predicated on being able to approach somebody and say, I think you're doing interesting work. I think there's a way you could elevate it. I think if we applied for this funding, it would give us the opportunity to ask and answer these questions. So I, that's what I have done up to this day, both inside and outside the university. Oh. Dude. So Kathy told me before we started something about courage and mm -hmm. I have to like echo that back to Kathy right now that like the courage to be able to approach someone and be like, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I can offer. Here's what I bring to the table. Here's how that can help you. Here's the value of that. You know, like, I don't know that just anybody, just everybody believes in themselves to mm -hmm. that degree, believes in the efficacy of what they can deliver. You know, oh, it's like, scary sometimes. It, oh, it can man. be scary sometimes. Your confidence is solid as far as like, see the idea, find the resources, bring it to life next. <laughs> like it's, it's beautiful. It's awesome. Well, and I will say going back to that story about Silver Bay and watching a one company town collapse, I never wanted to be the one who was dependent on the one company town. Right. Oh, so this grant writing was also a way to have some independence and to not be as vulnerable. Like I wasn't depending on just this one job to keep food, in, food in my kitchen and a roof over my head because, you know, like you could, I could bob and weave. Yeah. And I could insert myself into many different places so that I wasn't economically even dependent on like one thing yeah. as my source of well-being so yeah that's such an interesting tie with like yes watching a business that's that central to an entire community fail like I think about you know Holton where I live is about 3,500 people and if it cut in half overnight or I guess overnight how long did it take for the population to half I mean it it, it wasn't that long. It really wasn't. I think people held out for a while, but when reserve mining closed, I think there was quite an exodus. Mm. So um, I think it happened real. I mean, it's, I was a kid, so it's, you know, kind of hard, but I, in, I mean, it felt like months. Yeah. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I should well, look that up to, so that I can like understand, like, now that I'm an adult, like, look at the history. What does it say on Wikipedia, you know, right. or wherever? Right. Because you lived it, but I'll bet there's details in the record yes. that, like, either you didn't know or, like, as a kid, you wouldn't have paid attention to that or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I've been getting that message a lot to, like, return to your roots, return to your roots. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what roots are you talking about? But even just, like, hearing people's stories and I'm in the process now of like me telling my episodes and telling my stories so like mm. the roots man are being excavated a little bit our history is like go back and look what's there and I don't know what I'm supposed to find but I I do tend to just listen when I get that or I get a message over and over and over it's like there's something there that's calling for you mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> So, gosh, I feel like we got a really good summary of like your career overall. Mm -hmm. um, so how did like now as you come to the end of your major, then it sounds like you had the tool in your toolbox of like, I know how to do grant writing. So mm -hmm. did you just like stay where you were and like write your next grant or did you go somewhere else or yeah, how did you come up with your next idea? So I used that skill to write a grant when I was finishing my undergraduate degree to the Cargill University program for international travel. So I had one of my lab mates was from Ecuador 
And I wrote this grant to Cargill and they funded it. And uh, I went and lived in Ecuador. And uh, my my boss, Peter Graham, he also had a USAID um, bean cowpea, they're called collaborative research, SP something, bean cowpea crisp. It was a research program in Ecuador as well. So I went to Ecuador and worked with the Ministry of Agriculture in their small farm program. And Peter was doing this USAID project. So he would fly in and um, and he just asked me if I would like to continue in graduate school and work on this bean cowpea crisp in Ecuador. And I was like, that sounds that sounds very adventurous. He was actually more specific. I was actually sitting in my lab in the lab. Um at my own desk, which I was very proud to have a desk in the lab. That was a big sure, deal. Sure. And I'm studying for the medical school exam. And Peter says, you would be a fine doctor and you can do this if you want to. He says, but you'd also be an excellent soil scientist. So he said, and here's the deal. You go to grad school, you're going to end up with like a lot of student debt. You become a soil scientist, I'll pay you a stipend, you get medical insurance, and we pay your tuition. And I was like, dang, that sounds so easy. Plus, I, then I get to go back to Ecuador mm -hmm. and uh, do the research in, um, in South America, which I was having a thoroughly enjoyable time working in South America. Now, I think I might want to close that curtain. Sure. I, yeah. you know, I'm just going to pause this for just a second. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, no worries. I, I love the sunshine, but. It was, I was starting to have to bob and weave to keep it out of my eyes. Yeah. So yeah. So, okay, so anyway. So you so, were in Ecuador and then you came back? Yep. Okay. So how long were you there the first time? Oh, so a little bit less than a year. So I was there for a little bit yet less than a year. All in one go. All in one go. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, All like, sorts of adventures. I mean, okay. So then did you actually go back then for grad school to Ecuador? Yep. Okay. No. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So then I, I, I finished my undergrad degree. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter Graham uh, hired me as a research assistant. I was accepted into graduate school. I actually took my graduate, uh, you know, GRA exam in Quito, Ecuador and did perfectly fine considering, you know, you're kind of an unusual situation to take it. And yeah, so then I started graduate school and I did go back to Ecuador, where is where I did my field research for my master's degree. And how so long were you there that time? Another another year. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. What was it like to live it was in Ecuador? fabulous? Just fabulous. A very yeah. different culture, right? Yes. Yes, it was. Is. I hope it still is. I hear it's, I mean, I think there's a lot of homogenization happening. But when I was there in the early 90s, it was still, you know, there was no McDonald's. There was no, you know, like it was still its own place with its mm -hmm. own, you know, yeah. there was, it was, hadn't been westernized at all yet. So it was delightful. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a very good experience. What was I, your favorite thing to do oh, when you dancing. went out? Oh, dancing. God, yeah. Oh, yeah. I learned how to dance with, yes, with very handsome, you know, I was young, they were young. We spent many nights with dancing and having parties and oh. doing all the things that a college student should do. Yeah. It what was, the it most was really, really delightful. Yes. Amazing. And I would say dancing was probably the absolute best part of it. The research was fabulous too. The research was just really interesting. I was looking at production of edible dry beans, which they've been doing in Ecuador for over 6,000 years, right? So, and 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 the experience, one of the experiences I had there was um an experience that stays with me to this day which is standing, I'm standing in the, the Ecuadorian Andes, the Andes mountains, and working with people who've probably been growing edible beans this same way for well over 6,000 years. And, and thinking, you know, if, if the whole world collapsed, like these people's lives wouldn't necessarily change. 
and yeah. I compared it to like agriculture in Minnesota. And I was thinking, you know, like, like the feeling like they have a kind of resilience and knowledge that we don't even like, we might look at them with, you know, their planting techniques there. It's planted by hand, cultivated by hand. And, but, but they also have a resilience that we don't have in Minnesota. And, and that's really informed some of my work to this day. Like what asking myself over and over again, what makes, what makes agriculture and food systems resilient? What is it that makes these things, these systems resilient? What so have, what, what have you learned? Uh, I I'm still learning. I am still learning, right. but rural groceries are a part of it. We need to have diversity. We need to have diversity of access, diversity of scale. Um, you know, that's why I am so committed to keeping rural grocery stores open and running. And in Minnesota, we have 250 rural groceries in communities with population 2,500 or less. And that's kind of the segment that we focus our attention and work on, are though that scale of store. Um, and I have said, we just we have to have these stores hang on. We need we need the these are such assets dispersed along the the landscape. There they are the food access points in farm country. Mm. Right now, those stores serve as the end point in a global supply chain. Like it might be an apple from New Zealand that's flown to California and shipped to Minneapolis and then shipped to, you know, Big Stone County, Minnesota. So right now they kind of serve as that end point of a global food supply. But there's so much resilience because it could also be the front door to a local and regional food supply chain. Mm -hmm. Like these stores are dotted throughout farm country. If we needed to, you know, we could load wheat, edible beans, potatoes, garlic, strawberries onto that same supply chain. We could use that rural grocery store as the front door for farmers to get food into a local and regional food system. Mm -hmm. We could basically, you know, reverse the supply chain if we need it, as long as we can keep these assets on the landscape. So when I think about resilience, it's like making sure you're actually seeing that your eyes are actually open to what assets you have. Like what are the assets you have on the landscape? Making sure you are really clear eyed and see them. I mean, I look at our little grocery store in Clinton, Minnesota, population 400, and it is such a valuable asset. It is a public, it's a private company. It's a private business, but it is a hundred percent public good, public mm -hmm. asset. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one of the things that, so when I think about resilience, I think about that we need to hang on to the diversity, the diversity of, of these small businesses. And um, especially as they populate like farm country for one thing. I love all of that. Um, grocery stores as public goods and services. Like I feel like I could open a whole, a whole can of can of worms or, you know, I think it's yes. kind of fun, but is between the teeny little margins in independent grocery and them being like a for-profit business, it just like, doesn't really make sense to me. You know, like it's really not a for-profit business. <laughs> like if you look at it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a public service. Yeah. And so why do they pay taxes? You know, like, yeah. like, couldn't there be something in there that makes it easier? Mm. Or like, why do people pay sales tax on food? We you know, don't like, in Minnesota. Kansas is, no is phasing it out, the state tax, but there's still federal tax. So I assume you still pay federal tax. Federal not tax. on our, not, not. As a consumer, I go to the grocery store. The only thing I pay tax on is candy and I think like toilet paper, paper towels. Like, but you don't pay tax on any food stuff. Food, but food. Pop, yeah, I think we do pay tax on pop or as you that's may that's say, throw it off. Yes, no, pop. That's We're not that far <laughs> south. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, anyways, that's neither here nor there. But as far as your story, 
it sounds like resilience and sustainability are these themes that like from very early on, you were just passionate about, like, how do we make it resilient? How, what makes it sustainable? And I know you mentioned like watching the effect that the business going down in your, in one of the towns that you grew up in, like that had a huge effect. Do you think there was anything else that, cause like, I didn't see anything like that and resilience and sustainability are like two of the things that eat up the most amount of other than food itself. Like, what am I going to eat next? It's like resilience and sustainability. Like, how do we, how do we keep it going? I wonder how, like, how do you relate to those drives inside of you? Cause like, I know how I see it for myself and like, where do I think it comes from inside of me? But I mean, um, I'd rather hear about yours. (laughs) So last academic year, 22, 23, I was on sabbatical and I was asking this exact question. So my sabbatical is how do we build resilience in agriculture and food systems in the face of severe disruption? Mm. And I read so much literature on like the collapse of complex societies, the rise and fall of civilizations, you know, like I just immersed myself in literature. Um, And then, you know, then I, I found a disruption that is understudied. And then I just have totally dived into this as an area of work. So, but to your question, uh, last, uh, I think it was last February, I was invited to speak about what I was working on for my sabbatical at a uh, a kind of a farming community conference. It's called Back to Basics, where they like teach you things like, you know, around food production and food preservation, you know, um, you know natural resource management like it's a really cool conference and um i presented there on what i was learning about the impact of solar storms so that's what i'm looking at now is like the impact of solar storms like the the kind that cause aurora borealis um those are when you see the aurora it's actually the manifestation that the earth is having a geomagnetic storm so That's when you visually see Aurora, which we do, we were just, we could see him in Minnesota last week. You, you know, that there's a geomagnetic storm happening, but there's other, there could be other consequences with that. So I gave this presentation to farmers, a group of farmers talking about what would you do if there was a really serious geomagnetic storm? Like what's plan A, what's plan B? What would you as a farmer do in the face of this kind of disruption? And it was a really lively conversation. And there was a reporter there. He actually wrote an article about what I was writing about. I could, I could send you the link. It was was an article. And after everybody left the room, there was one farmer who stayed there. And he said, oh, he said, from the time I was a little kid, I'd lay in bed and I would be like, oh, I sure hope the grownups are thinking, what would you do if such and such happened? What would you do if such and such happened? He's like, I always was like hoping that someone was thinking about like, well, this works now, but if it didn't, you know, and he said, so I later came to identify that characteristic in myself. He said, I, I am a scout. So like I identify myself as a scout, like I'm always like a few steps ahead saying, yeah, that's fine. But what if, what if like, look, look further down, look a few more steps down, like keep looking out. And he said to me, you're a scout, you're a scout too. Mm-hmm. So he was like, you and I are scouts. And I, I, just, I yeah, I totally resonate with that. I, so, yeah. so I think I probably have always been a scout, but what I saw in like when reserve mining closed down in Silver Bay, Minnesota, and seeing the impact it had on community, it just made it like, oh yeah, everything looks so idyllic. I'm in one of the finest schools in the state and all these cute little houses that all these people live comfortable union job, middle-class lives, boom, gone, right? And so I think I've always been able to kind of see, kind of look past the veneer to mm-hmm. say, well, yeah, this looks great, but where might it be vulnerable? And you won't even know that it's vulnerable. So, um, and I've, I've always, I have always been 
this way. About, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, I was invited to uh, contribute to the strategic planning of one of the major philanthropic foundations in Minnesota. And it was with the board and the president and all the staff. And I was I was grateful to be part of this group. And they went around the table asking people like, what do you think are going to be the biggest issues facing us in the coming decades? And, you know, it was all like, you know, poverty, food access, um, changing demographics, you know, lots of, you know, environmental issues, climate change, all those things. And they got to me and I said, I'm concerned about a pandemic. And people were like, what? Like, what? Like, you mean like what happened like a hundred years ago? Kind of like pandemic. I'm like, yeah, I think we have neglected the fact that there could still be pandemics. And they were like, yeah, next. Like people, they really thought I was, I mean, like I was nuts, right? Like This was like 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No one was talking about there's going to be a pandemic 15 years ago. Oh, and so when COVID finally hit, all three of my kids were, you know, still living at home and they were like, oh, thank goodness it's finally here because mom's been talking about this like for so long. Like, you never know. We could run out of oil. There could be a pandemic, you know, like there could be civil unrest. You just you never know what's going to happen in the world. And my kids are like, yeah, yeah, that's interesting, mom, you know. They're like, we've lived in the same house since we were three and we don't yes. know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> like it's all the same. <laughs> when they were, when they were little, they would be like, mom, when are we going to learn to drive? I'm like, oh, don't worry. There won't be cars by the time they're 16. I'm like, no, I think we're going to run out of oil before then or climate change, whatever. We're not going to be driving cars when you're 16. So you don't have to worry. You don't about even it. worry about it. Don't even oh, worry about driving. So my oh, kids bring that up all the time. Like mom makes predictions and then she's wrong quite frequently wrong. But for me, it's not, I'm not seeking to be right. I'm seeking to say, what, what else is beyond the veil of this world that you're not understanding or seeing that could make it more vulnerable than it appears on the surface, right? Yeah. Like what, what is, what else is out there in yeah. the world? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah that we just aren't paying attention to. And there's a lot of them. So mm, aren't there. And I'm not unhappy and I don't worry. It doesn't keep me awake at night. This is not like people say, Kathy, you need to stop smiling when you're talking about like solar storms. Like, like these are, this could be very serious. You just keep smiling through this. Like, oh, and then there could be a solar storm. And they're like, stop smiling. And then the world could end. No, right. I, yeah. But it's like, we've identified it. It's a thing and we know about it and we're creating backup plans and we're yeah. getting prepared and there is an yeah. excitement to the ability to prepare for something. Like, That's, yes, I totally get it. I'm right there with you. I'm a natural worst case scenario generator mm. and it served me really well as far as like project management and like, yeah. how do you get from point A to point B no matter what happens? Yeah. You know, like no matter what, okay, well, we'll have this backup plan at this backup plan and this, it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel stressful. Stressful is when I'm not thinking about those things yeah. when it's like, you know, I, yeah, to use your word, like I'm leaving myself vulnerable to an unsuspected disruption, yeah. something yeah. that I haven't planned for. I didn't prepare for it. I'd rather just be prepared. Yeah. And so, yeah, like a lot goes on in, on, in the thinking places, yes. but yep. uh, that's so cool to, to meet another scout. I love that. Yeah. I wonder if anybody else who watches will resonate as like, oh, I think oh. I'm a scout too. Yeah. Put it in the comments. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> I love that. I, well, and next time I'll have to share, like, I see mine somewhat similar. Basically I use different language though. So mm. yeah, maybe next time I can tell my version, but yeah. we'll, we'll save that for, for the next one and okay. come back and here's some more. Okay. I would love to hear just basically anything else, more pivotal moments, more right place, right time, you know, yeah. where we can't plan to put ourselves in a certain situation and yet 
life will put us in the right place at the right time. Like probably one of my best examples was me running a grocery store in the COVID pandemic. Yes. Like how did that happen? How yeah. did I get here? I ask myself that question like regularly and yet kind of like what you're saying, like stop smiling. It's the end of the world. Like I was like, I was born for this. You were. I was made for this, for you like are. extreme disruption. And I yes. am the calm. I am yeah. the eye of the storm. And like yeah. everything around me is changing. And it's like, great. The world finally makes sense. <laughs> and like, yeah. it felt like what I live all the time. Now everybody's living it yeah. of like, you know, the shit could always hit the fan, but the shit actually hit the fan. And at least now we're all on the same page, you know? And I felt prepared. Like, you were. You know, you just, you do the best you can and you tell the truth. And that's like all you can ever do. You know, those were the only tools I had. And that is when you and I met. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I started following you and I just so appreciated. I hope you have those videos archived. You were giving us daily updates yeah. Yeah. on what was happening. And I was learning so much from you. It was so what you were doing, you were on the van, you were on the vanguard. And y your transparency and you know what you were doing to keep the grocery store open and and everything that was unfolding at that time. Uh yeah, I was I Really, I think I think I did ask to have your videos downloaded mm -hmm. um, so that we could have them archived. I think I we have them archived someplace, but that was that was super valuable. And yes, I I can see that you did you didn't lose it. You did not lose it during that time, and you you actually went very public with what the challenges were. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I think you were out of ground or you were having to limit people to like one pound of ground beef. Lots of things were limited. And I'm like, dang, don't you have more cattle per capita than people, which you do? It's right? a processing limitation. I know. The bottleneck was processing. So yeah, processing. I mean, on all the things, milk yeah. processing, egg processing, like they've got producers dumping milk on the grounds and the grocery store shelves are empty yeah. all because the processing plants are already running at a hundred percent. So when you drink all the milk, we can't bottle more any faster than we already are. So yeah, the it was so funny. The reason I was doing that was because I was on the front lines. And even though the store wasn't open to the public for very long, like we were open to the public maybe like five days of the pandemic and it was full on chaos inside the store and somebody was going to get hurt. Like even beyond COVID, the pushing, the shoving, I just couldn't, the yelling at my employees, like I I just couldn't take it. I really couldn't. And then plus the thought of like, we don't know what COVID even is. And I got high school kids in here, you know, like people who are coming to work and like, what is my duty at this point? And I felt keeping the staff safe was number one, because we can't run a grocery store unless you got the 30 people who are helping you do that. So yeah, like keeping them safe was number one, but the most of the people I'll say were very cool. And if anything, I feel like the loyalty of our customers just went through the roof at that time. Like the ones who were already loyal, they became more loyal in the process and new people started shopping and became loyal customers because of what we were doing. But we got a lot of pushback for the choices that we were making and like the first day I did the live stream was the day I put the limit on milk and the first customer who caught me and was telling me about it, I did the first live stream because I was like, okay, it's not personal. I don't want you to skip your cereal in the morning. Okay. I'm not trying to be an asshole here. Legitimately, we are facing some really difficult challenges that I don't even expect customers to be able to understand that. And that's why I took the approach I did, which was education. You know, like maybe you won't yell at me if you understand <laughs> that this is so far outside of our control. 
there's nothing any of us are going to be able to do. So yelling at anybody is not going to help the situation. Okay. So my whole goal was like, just to calm everybody down (laughs) because yeah, the pushing and the shoving really just made me a little bit sick to my stomach. Who was pushing and shoving customers or employees? Customers. Customers. Like the last morning that we were open to the public before we closed for, I think it was almost three months that we were closed to the public. Um, The last morning there were like 20 customers outside the door when we opened and they like herded their way into the store and a little old lady got shoved into a wall and we were closed for business the next day. Like we did the delivery and curbside pickup only. We shopped over the phone and by email. Well, that was what I was going to ask. Cause I think we modeled a fact sheet after what you were doing mm. because so many of these small town stores, like, yeah, you could order your groceries from target, mm-hmm. but in a town of 400 people, there was no online option. Right. Did you start doing, did you ask, how did you ask people to get you their grocery lists? So they called in and we put them on the list to shop. And then we had shoppers who on their cell phones would call that customer and like, okay, so I'm in the produce department. What do you need from the produce department? Now we're in the milk section. What do you need here? And like literally walk them through the store and shop for them. And then we could do um, debit and credit card payments over the phone. And most people were totally cool with that. You know, like, I think if anything, we probably had a lot more feedback that was like, that's actually why I'm shopping here. You know, I'm not willing to go into the free for all down the street. I would rather take this approach. I like it better. And so thank you for doing it. So I feel like that's what we heard more often, but especially in those days when we were still open and I had already started putting the limits on because I mean, toilet paper was just gone in like a day and I'm over here like we ordered more and none came. So the warehouse is already out. So I don't know when I'm going to get more toilet paper. And now I see the milk is doing it. The bread is doing it. Like there just won't be anything here. And like that can be a thing. I mean, we sold the groceries. Again, I'm like sitting there in this moral dilemma. Like what is my duty? Is my duty to like maximize sales and just get the food off the shelves and like we sold it great or to like be a source of food for the community. Right. Because if my shelves are empty, I'm no longer a source of food. And I wanted to hold on to that, whether that was the right choice or not, like whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there is such a thing as a right choice in that kind of a situation. There certainly was no rule book. There was only like, what do you think is the most right thing? right here, right now. And you better just trust your gut because there's nobody else in your shoes. You know, nobody that can tell you you did a good thing or not. And you were influential at that time. You reached out to me on Facebook Messenger. We had like a call one morning where we actually got to talk. You gave me the, um, what was it, where they could like buy a food box? Mm, Yeah, the meal kit. Yes, yes, yes. The meal kit. So I, we sold a bunch of those. Did you um, really? I yeah. Never, a I bunch of people, that. like $2,000 worth of meal kits that That's people so bought and we gave cool. away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Carly, I had not heard that. Yeah. So, so, so part of me being who I am, I was actually in Iceland at the end of January and I was already tracking the John Hopkins map of where COVID was and where it was spreading. And I was like, I was in the, I was in Iceland with two of my kids who were, you know, minors and we got home and I was like, I like, I was like, I think we need to pay, like, I was like, we need to pay attention to this. I took my kids out of school before the governor closed down. I took my kids out more than a week before the governor closed down schools. I called the superintendent and I was like, take my kids out of school. I, I am concerned about this COVID thing. And anyway, because I am who I am, I started creating that meal kit, like back in like the end of February, I took two giant grocery carts into my, literally it's, we have the, the, first aisle of bread, the second aisle with, you know, like dish soap and toilet paper, the third aisle with chips and the fourth aisle with freezer stuff. It's a very small store, but I 
went through, I called the grocery wholesaler because I had a relationship with the wholesale grocer. I said, send me, if you can send me spreadsheets of what you actually have a lot of, like send me what your quantities are. And then I will go into my grocery store and I will try to build a kit on what is actually available in the food mm. supply chain. So I built that kit. I took over our entire dining room and then I had extension nutrition educators consulting with me. And I'm, it's like a giant chessboard and I'm moving packages around I'm like okay here's day one here's day two oh, that's not gonna work here's day two and we built out that seven, uh, 14 day meal kit yeah. I made a couple of them a few different designs I worked with extension nutrition educators we wrote it up and we had that published the same week the governor closed down schools in Minnesota so that's how being the hope for the best plan for the worst human yeah out yeah influenced my brain so that i had that that we we boom we could create that kit bring in the resources to write it up and it was downloaded all over the world and people were calling me and it's like we're the vegan society of you know minnesota and we want to convert your meal kit to vegan i'm like have at it great <laughs> go for it yeah do that that is a oh great idea gosh. take it cut it that's Taste so it. amazing so to hear that you actually, like I sent you that and you ha actually had people who bought those kits, that's just really, that's really cool. And I don't think, I think it's, it was needed at the time and it's not needed now. Although, you know, I mean, if you watch the news, there's another, it appears there's another respiratory virus emerging in China right now, mm. you know? So, you know, people are kind of like getting a little nervous again. But I, I felt like that was an idea this, whose time came and went. The the meal kits, mm -hmm. you know, like we don't need meal kits anymore because we don't need to quarantine. We're not quarantining. We didn't know what we were doing at the time. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. letting me know that that was something that your, your store used as well. Yeah. So very yeah. cool. Very cool. I had no idea at the time it was so ready and so available. I thought you guys just already had it. And you were like, here, this would help you. I didn't realize you had just made it. That's just amazing. Me. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And it yeah, was like, and it was, it was, see, again, I should stop smiling when I do this, but it was fun. <laughs> right. Was fun. Like I'm weighing, like, cause it's an intellectual exercise. Like mm -hmm. I'm weighing boxes, like, okay, we're going to need three boxes. Cause we don't want them to be more than so many pounds. So that yeah. people, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. So well, yeah. it's like a puzzle. Yeah, it's like a puzzle. It's yeah. Like a puzzle. I, are you a big puzzle fan? I am a huge puzzle fan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I get down on a puzzle too. And that's kind of why I like it. Like if it's repetitive, if it's like, I already know what to expect, I just am bored and restless. And so I'd rather venture out into the unknown and like have to live on my instincts and stuff. So and just respond to like what pops up. Um, yeah. And Hope for the best, like you said. Like, yeah, really all you can do. Yep. It's all going to land how it lands, no matter right. what. And the yes. projects that we do along the way, you know, making the 14 day meal kit, live streaming every day, talking about what's going on, like the things that we do, I think are mostly just to give ourselves a sense of purpose in the middle of the chaos. Like, look, I'm yeah. doing something. What else can I be doing? Nothing that I can think of. And I'm doing the only thing I can do, you know? Yeah. And at that point, mm -hmm. like, you got to let yourself off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good times. I actually want to, <laughs> good times. I actually want to do like a, like a panel discussion on the COVID-19 grocery experience and have like, you would be awesome on the panel. And then a couple other grocers, uh, Jeannie, who's a consultant. She was a consultant during that time. So she was hearing from like all of her clients. And I think both of you would be able to give more of like a bigger picture kind of viewpoint um but yeah to like kind of have all of us on the discussion and like talk about like what was what was that like and what did we learn and what changed for the better maybe you know because I think there were things on that list where if COVID hadn't come through that would not have changed and it's a good thing that it did so yeah. you know maybe give some some credit to the positives that can come out of such disruptive things sure. bring it on I'll be happy you you yeah. you you make the call, I will show up. So oh, beautiful. Okay. And, and, and one thing I want to say about this way of thinking and being, which, you know, 
is that it makes you able to be so grateful for mm -hmm. what you do have and for yeah. what is in place and what is working, yeah. right? And so, you know, I live in Minnesota. It is very cold. And I'm grateful that I have a warm home. I'm grateful that I have a ribbon of highway that I can drive down. And, you know, like when you see things as, you know, just because it makes you less likely to take things for granted yeah, and to be grateful for what is around you. If you recognize that that's not a guarantee, right? right. It's not a guarantee that there's toilet paper, milk, ground beef on that shelf. That's not a guarantee. You think it's a guarantee, right? And you might be angry if it's not there, but there's, there's no guarantee. Yeah. yeah. And so that makes you able to approach what you do have with a profound sense of gratitude. Yeah. It, it does for me. It does for me. I can, I can draw mm -hmm. on that multiple times a day. And maybe that's mm -hmm. why thinking about these things doesn't make me unhappy because like you said, we've got time to think about what does it mean to be resilient? What is it? What we've got time, we've got the space right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and just in general, like I, I very much resonate with what you're saying about like the frequency of things changing in the world around us, especially these last few years has had me kind of pull my anchor up out of the physical world and like drop it inside myself mm. so that like, I'm not really getting yanked around like a yo-yo mm. on a string with like everything that is happening in the world. Like I have a sense of stability inside of myself. Like what is constant? What is truly not ever going to change? And the beat of my heart, the breath in and out of my lungs, like those are the things that I have no matter what. And like you said, like everything else, it, I mean, it could just be gone. Yeah. So like, what really are we resting on? Mm -hmm. You know, like what is our support system and how sustainable is it really? And yeah, I, I think about that a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such a good conversation. I would yeah. love to hear the comments on this one. Yeah. I feel like we went to some a little bit deeper places than we've been on the podcast yet, but I am totally all for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, I don't know if we could talk about it this time, but I, and maybe this is a, a place we could end, but I feel like your podcast project and a project, uh, a creative, uh, a fiction project, uh, project that I'm working on, they actually have a lot in common in that I feel like the voices that you're helping to bring with your podcast and um, the stories that I want to tell as well, it is it is sort of a uh, a love song to uh, some things that are still good and solid and um, offer some resilience for our communities that we need to, uh, it kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier. We need to acknowledge assets where they are and sometimes they're overlooked. And I think Carly, that's what I love so much about the stories that you're putting out in your podcast is that these are like that couple who talked about starting a grocery store when they were in their twenties, yeah. you know, like just going on faith and, you know, my brother's a construction worker, yeah. my other brother's a plumber, my other brother's an electrician. So we built a grocery store, you know, like, like hearing those stories from those communities, like, I feel like those are assets that we could overlook. And it's a, a kind of, sometimes we call it appreciative inquiry, like asking questions in a way that we are appreciating what we have and how did we get there? How did we get those good things that we have? And yeah. what did it take as individuals or a community or a family to knit those things together yeah. so that we actually do have some resilience yeah. in our in ourselves, which is what I heard you also talking about, the resilience, the anchor, the resilience in ourselves, mm -hmm. in our, our households or farmsteads or communities or regions or states. Like, and so um that that's the project that I am working on now as well. Oh gosh. Yes. Let's let's talk about that next yeah. time. And yeah. yeah, more about 
this drive to put more resilience into the world and not necessarily to like change anybody or make the world a better place even, but I feel like through however I did this, I don't even fully understand it, but like I feel pretty solid in myself compared to a lot of what I see in the world with the ups and the downs and things. And I just feel like it hurts me to watch people suffer. It hurts to think about people who think the limit on milk is about them. You know, it hurts me to think that people are are suffering when they don't have to. And so personally, this this podcast, like the suffering that I hope comes like lets the air out of the balloon a little bit by hearing these stories is that it does all fall together. You know, like the guy flips the coin and it does come down on your side. Yeah. Like that happens. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in, in the world, there's like one of two things, either everything is a dumpster fire or there's only like the highlight reel of like the Instagram life, like the cars and the boats and the things. And it's like, where are the real people? who are just good hearted people and they're doing what they're doing, not for a round of applause, but because they took over the dining room and they worked it all out and they had fun doing it. Like these people exist. I know they do. I've met them a lot through the grocery business. There's a ton of them. When you get into grocery and get plugged into that network, they're everywhere. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, like what a gift if I could, you know, take my light of my attention, my time and interview these people bring them forward you know and then like the the episode that just aired um right before we're recording this the first episode with dan Nagengast. i didn't even know dan a month or two ago Jeannie wells was like he is incredible you would love him he's got to be on your podcast let me let me reach out to him and see if he'd be interested and oh my gosh like what a fascinating character and now how many people are going to get to watch these stories because we're sitting here for an hour and a half of our lives. But yeah, we're not going to get that back, but it's been fun. And how many thousands of hours are people going to spend watching this? Mm. Mm. Like it's fun to think about. It's really fun for me to think about the exponential impact of working like this, where I put in an hour, maybe two per episode and the watch time, like, Maybe not just yet when the views are what they are, but I mean, if with even only 30,000 views, 40,000 views, there's like 10,000 watch hours that come along with that. So like you do two hours worth of work and 10,000 worth of impact. Like, I love that. (laughs) Like that that reminds me. That's an interesting, interesting frame for that. Yeah. Yeah. It -hmm. reminds me of what you were saying about like the grant writing tool and like the power that it opened up within you where it's like, you know, sure, I can talk one-on-one with people and be very successful, like talking to them and building rapport with them. But Mm -hmm. then I can only talk to one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And I really want to touch way more hearts than that, you know, like if I'm being really honest. So the podcast route, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And yeah, I see the numbers growing. I mean, we're not going anywhere. We're just going to keep doing episodes as they're fun to do. And they'll be there for, I mean, people could find these years down the road. Yeah. Knock on wood. Yeah. 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 Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Little apocalypse joke there to top us off. <laughs> yes. That's what I'm <laughs> exactly what it was. <laughs> if zombies come in. You may not be watching this. Okay. But Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, we're going to hope for the best. Oh my gosh, Kathy, this has been (laughs) so much fun. Delightful, delightful. Thank you, Carly. Oh, I can't wait for the next one. Sounds Um, good. Everyone else, thank you for listening. Take a second, like the video on your way out. We would love to hear your comments um, down below. Kathy will be back hopefully on many other episodes. We'll continue the conversation until next time. Everybody take really good care of themselves. Hopefully you're finding some resilience in your life wherever you are and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye.